ask any citizens of Hamburg to name those sites or features which they think most represent their city to themselves and to the world, and top of their list will almost certainly be the Graceful Rathaus or City Hall. St. Michael's Church on its hill. The Alster Lake that lies in the city's heart. Along with the 20th century Chile House and the city's great international port, they are the very symbols of Hamburg. They also represent between them, in the city hall, Hamburg's civic pride. In St. Michael's, its faith. In the Alster Lake, its beauty, and in the port, its commerce and prosperity. It is still within living memory that they were all in danger of vanishing from Hamburg altogether. In the horrifying firestorm in the summer of 1943, On my way home, all the houses around me were on fire, people rushing to shelters. I saw some bodies lying in the street, and people were shouting at me to come into their air raid shelters. But I only wanted to get home to my parents. When we came out of the shelter, the dead were lying all around, all burnt. They had caught fire and some had jumped into the lake. Horses jumped in as well, but they were still burning when they came out. The phosphorus bombs were horrifying. People near the Alster Lake plunged in, hoping the water would put out the flames on their clothing. But it was no use. It was just frightful. There was hardly any air in the shelter. Everybody was gasping for air. I wished a bomb would just drop on us then and there to end the suffering. The city of Hamburg was no stranger to destruction by fire. Almost exactly 100 years before, in 1842, the town centre had been almost completely burnt to the ground and then rebuilt on a more spacious pattern. The stronghold or burg of Hammer was founded at the beginning of the 9th century and gradually established itself as a leading port, despite the fact that it wasn't even anywhere near the sea coast, but more than 60 miles inland. But due to its favorable position on one of Western Europe's major navigable rivers, the Elbe, with its wide outlet to the North Sea, and from there to the oceans of the world, it had already become one of the world's leading ports by the start of this century. Its merchant ships were trading regularly with North and South America, Africa, the Far East, and Australia. Before this, the ocean-going merchant vessels had anchored away from the inner port area, their goods being offloaded into barges and wherries, and from there, they were brought to the quayside for final unloading. But as trade grew rapidly in volume, Larger sheds and warehouses had to be constructed, with cranes and other facilities for direct quayside unloading of their cargoes. So that already before the war, Hamburg possessed some of the largest warehouses in the world. Trade increased even further when part of the port area of Hamburg was established as a free port. With no customs duties imposed on imported goods being stored, and transshipped. But the port of Hamburg was engaged not only in the shipping of goods, but of people as well. The Hapag Lloyd shipping line was famous all over the world for its passenger services, with offices in every major city of the globe. And this became increasingly so after the First World War, during the golden age of the great transatlantic ocean liners and their luxury cruises. During the interwar years too, 
through the prosperity of Hamburg's port, the city itself expanded outwards and upwards. With imaginative new buildings, such as architect Fritz Herger's 10-story office block, the Chili House, shaped like the prow of a great ocean liner. Hamburg was already Germany's largest city after Berlin, with a population approaching two million. And it could also claim to be continental Europe's largest port by the time war broke out in 1939. For the first few months of the war, life in Hamburg seemed to change very little, and only very gradually, for its citizens. I suppose the first time that we really became aware of the fact that there was a war on was when we were issued with food coupons, all of a sudden. The food situation hadn't been at all bad during the first year of the war, but they decided to introduce rationing anyway, even if only as a precaution. After that, the first air attacks on Hamburg took place, but well before the raids began, the authorities got us to convert our house cellars into shelters. We were all given ARP training about what to do in the event of a raid, not only the men, but the women too, and how to put out any fires caused by incendiary bombs. My name is Ralf Olhagen. I was born in Bregede, a town on the River Elbe, in 1935. My father worked there and he was transferred to Hamburg in the year the war started, 1939. We went to live in a flat in the Iflandstrasse, quite close to the Alster Lake in the city center. I started school a couple of years later. At that time, we led a fairly quiet life in Hamburg, even though the war was on. I lived like any normal boy, aged about six. Our life was occasionally interrupted by short air raids, but nothing very severe at first. It was generally like that everywhere in Germany during the first year or so of the war. But suddenly, from April 1940, everything changed. After a long period of inactivity, German forces invaded Denmark and Norway, and then west across their borders through the Low Countries and France. As the Allied armies withdrew and France fell, the Germans occupied the North Sea and Channel coasts. The next stage of the battle was soon to begin. Scarcely ten minutes away in flying time, across that narrow stretch of water lay the chalk cliffs of Dover and the airfields and ports of southern England. The German air force was ready to strike and the Battle of Britain had begun. For the summer weeks from the end of June to the start of September, the Luftwaffe pounded away at British shipping and air bases to prepare for the planned invasion. With the daily attacks on the southeast corner of England, the Dover area became known as Hell's Corner. But as summer days passed by, the German leadership decided on a change of strategy and abandoned their invasion plans. Instead, they set out to pound the British economy into defeat with attacks on factories, industrial and commercial centers, and on London itself. And especially the East End Dockland area, the Port of London. The attacks continued night after night 
from September onwards. Till then, Britain's air force had done very little in the way of vital attacks on German targets. They had the disadvantage that targets on German soil were four and more hours flying time distance from their bomber bases, and usually beyond the range of their protecting fighter planes. Compared to the short distances which the German planes needed to fly from their bases in occupied France. Nevertheless, they began to launch a series of attacks across the North Sea, directed against the North German ports such as Bremen, Lübeck and Hamburg. Hamburg still traded to some degree with neutral countries, as well as being an important centre for manufacturing U-boats and other vital German military vessels. At that stage, the port and city were well defended against attacks from British bombers. Um, initially, we used to reckon you were better off going in early because they, they had things weren't warmed up. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, when there were fewer of you, there was uh, uh, more, more chance of you being sort of isolated and picked out. On the home front too, Hamburg's air raid precautions were among the best in Germany. They had had the foresight to construct giant fortified public bunkers, as well as relying on domestic cellar shelters. Even some hospitals and their operating theatres were provided with bunkers. During the early raids, all those in reach of public shelters were able to feel reasonably secure within the walls of the well-protected bunkers. And the raids seldom lasted very long because of the limited flying time the enemy planes could afford to stay airborne. Solved was getting out of searchlights because they used to put a load of searchlights onto you and do what they called a cone. And our problem was to the problem was to get out of that because once you were lit up, see in those days we were flying at about five, four, five, six thousand feet, something like that. And uh, once you were in there, the gunners on the ground had a target to shoot at, and they used to pep, give you a rather warm time. As well as that, they used to have fighters, um, single-seater fighters and whatnot, roaming around. And once they saw somebody caught in a searchlight, I mean, it was an obvious target. Well, this happened to us over Hamburg. We got caught and we couldn't get out of it. And eventually, sort of duck dive, and that's the right, the only thing to do is stick the nose down. So we stuck the nose down and then we'd get, get out of it as quickly as we could. But of course, they followed us down. So we were sort of quite low down, just on the outskirts of Hamburg. And by the time we got clear of the lights, we were too low to climb back up again because it was still a defended area, so we stayed on the ground. And uh, that was about half an hour of hectic flying. Relatively little damage was caused in many of the RAF raids of late 1940. And indeed, the German authorities were even able to turn them into useful propaganda for themselves, as in this newsreel. The commentator says, English bombing attacks against German cities seem to be directed almost exclusively against civilian and non-military objectives. In this Hamburg district, 22 children were killed. After that action, London assumed that Hamburg, suffering from such an attack, was reduced to ruin, and its streets and ports pulverized. The German government invited German and foreign journalists to visit Hamburg. From the tower of the Church of St. Michael, 
they saw a city undestroyed and whose population went on quietly about their occupations. Newsreels like this were turned out in English and other languages for consumption by the American public and foreign journalists to claim how ineffectual the British raids were. The air raid gradually became worse and worse. At first it hadn't been too bad. We just stayed in our flat, didn't go to a shelter, and watched what was happening outside from our window. The RAF dropped signal flares to mark their targets, red and green. We all called them Christmas trees because of the colours. During 1941, the bomber aircraft of the British Air Forces were becoming more efficient, carrying larger and heavier loads, and capable of greater flying time, and were beginning to cause as much damage as the raids on London. When this raid came, it must have been in 1941, I think. It was really frightening because the lights went out. The cellar timbers started cracking. One high explosive bomb after the other kept coming, and we thought that one of them would surely hit us. It was really frightening. People started to cry and scream. There was no way out of the house while the raid was on, and we thought it was soon going to be our turn to be bombed. But thank heavens it didn't happen. And in fact, all the houses in our neighborhood escaped destruction throughout the whole of the war. This period was beginning to see the last of the smaller scale raids on specific targets, even though their accuracy and effectiveness had greatly increased. The war in the air stood at the threshold of a major change. Also, ab 1943, the first carpet bombing took place. Hamburg and its surroundings were very heavily attacked. This bombing began during the end of July in 1943. It was part of the plan of the British Chief of Bomber Command. Let the Nazis take good note of the western horizon. There they will see a cloud as yet no bigger than a man's hand. We cannot send a thousand bombers a time over Germany every time as yet. But the time will come when we can do so. Nevertheless, from this time on, the scale of air raids over German cities began to increase both in size and number. Little could anyone suspect when this raid on Hamburg began that it would go down in history as the world's first city to suffer a firestorm.
It arose through an unusual combination of factors. The weather those last days of July 1943 had been very hot and dry. Everything on the ground burned more easily, and a large number of individual incendiary fires gradually began to merge and burn as one giant bonfire. The rising heat formed violent upcurrents and consequently sucked in fresh air at ground level, reaching speeds of gale and even hurricane force. The fires burned with such intense heat that people in shelters began to suffocate. Dieser Röhrenbunker war ungefähr für 300 Leute gedacht. This shelter was designed for about 300 people. But during the night, up to 500 people arrived. We had a hand pump for pumping air in, but we had to stop doing that later as everything around us was destroyed and was burning. And the only thing that came in was smoke. So we stopped pumping. It started around midnight and well, later we could not breathe properly anymore. No air could get in and there were so many people. etwa eine halbe Stunde bei uns im Keller mit meinen Angehörigen zusammen, bis dann... Äh, After we'd been in our basement shelter for about half an hour, we smelled something burning. When the fire brigade arrived, they told us that our building had been hit by two incendiaries and that our roof was on fire. Wir dann sofort aus dem Keller raus. Glücklicherweise waren unsere Großeltern... So we left our basement at once and tore off to my grandparents, who fortunately had a flat nearby. We went into their basement shelter, and after about another two hours, this house was hit too, and we were all trapped in the basement. We just couldn't get out. There was an elderly lady in the basement with us, whose sister was outside the house and was actually trying to remove the rubble to get inside. Die holte uns insofern nächsten Tag aus dem Keller raus. The fireman outside thought that she was mad and tried to restrain her. And while they were doing so, they gradually became aware of us, knocking and screaming inside the basement. So they set to to make their way into our blocked basement, and finally they reached us and got us out. If it hadn't been for the determination of that lady's sister, we would have all died in that shelter. The raids continued over the following days and engulfed the port of Hamburg with its warehouses, sheds, quays and bridges. Thousands of bombed out people took refuge after the firestorm in one or other of the city's parks, with what few possessions they had managed to rescue and take with them, in handcarts, cases, prams. Many of them left the city never to return again. After our rescue from my grandparents' basement, my mother decided to return to our flat but when we got there, we found the building burnt out. The whole of the street was completely bombed out. Since we didn't have anywhere to live in Hamburg, my mother decided to move to our grandparents' house in Lüneburg. So we set off with hundreds of people out of the city. 
With my brother and me, the only possessions my mother left with were what she could pack into a tiny suitcase. And we made our way on foot on the long, long road to Lüneburg, 30 miles away. It took us at least a couple of days or so, sleeping on the roadside along the route, till we were picked up by a lorry and taken the last mile or two to our grandparents in Lüneburg. The Americans attacked during the day. Sometimes we had to go to the shelter three times a day and three times a night and slept with our clothes on as there was no time to get dressed. However, everything was put back in order very quickly. Everything was well organized. Things were put back in order so that people could go back to their flats, if the flats were still there. However, in the second attack, during which we got bombed out, the bombs started to drop immediately after the air raid warning. After America had entered the war, her aircraft and crews very soon added their enormous bombing capacity to the conflict, carrying out most of their raids during the day, following nighttime raids of the RAF on a round-of-the-clock basis. The Americans and British were bombing towns and cities all over Germany now. It was around this time that Germany began flying bomb attacks on Britain, and London in particular. And later, the Allied bombers were seeking to bomb the V-2 sites in North Germany at Peenemunde. My name is Gunther Hosfeld. I was born in 1938 and we lived here in Harburg, a suburb on the south side of Hamburg. In 1944, Harburg was attacked by American bombers. It was a heavy raid. When my mother and I finally came out of the neighborhood shelter, we could see that all the houses along the street had escaped any serious damage, except for the house that we lived in, which was completely destroyed. That's the house behind me, since rebuilt. The American bombers were probably aiming for our oil refineries, but because the visibility got worse that day, they couldn't see the target, so they just dropped their bombs in the general area. We were very lucky to survive that attack in our shelter, just across the street from our house. I can remember there was just a pile of rubble in place of our house. And the ladies who had been in the shelter with us began to cry when they saw that our house had been totally destroyed. I suppose I was still too young to be really upset by that sight. And more important to me was a toy I found on top of the rubble, which I've still got. The destruction of our house had stirred up a lot of dust, which still hadn't settled when we came out of the shelter. And there was this 
dust cloud that seemed to hover above the pile of rubble which had been our house. Staub hatte sich noch gar nicht gelegt, sondern er war noch zu sehen über diesem Schutthaufen. From central Germany to Hamburg, the synthetic oil plants had become primary targets by the middle of 1944 to deny oil to the German armed forces. On the 20th of June, 1944, a special raid was launched against the Hamburg refineries by American bombers. The seven-hour flight took them along the coast past Heligoland to their target destination, the oil storage and refining plants along the Elbe River. Sustained bombings had reduced Germany's oil production so far by over 60%. And the Hamburg raid was designed to put that source of fuel out of action once and for all. Though this and other such raids were largely successful, these storage and refinery areas were very heavily defended. The American bombers met with great resistance and suffered their share of losses during raids. Also high on the list of priority targets during the last months of the war was Germany's communications system. Under Operation Clarion, strikes against the railways overwhelmed the repair capabilities of the railway system and contributed to the general disruption of transport. Bombers continue to strike at marshalling yards. As well as the railways, strikes were carried out successfully on other aspects of communications, including roads, canals, and bridges. Along with the aerial onslaught, the Allied ground forces had been making strong advances during the early part of 1945. The American 9th Army and other units were thrusting forward into Germany across the maze of canals and streams, often flooded at that time of the year, parallel to the advances of their British and Canadian allies further north. The British troops had met with unexpectedly stiff resistance in taking Bremen. The situation regarding any resistance from Hamburg was still unclear, not only to the British troops, but to the citizens of Hamburg as well. We didn't know whether Hamburg would be defended or not. One time the answer was yes, and then it was no again. And Karl Kaufmann, the mayor, said that Hamburg had suffered quite a lot already and that there was hardly anything left. Da kam dann der Engländer rein, ne? Da war dann der Krieg ziemlich zu Ende und the British arrived at the beginning of May 1945. The war was more or less over. At that time, we were pretty scared because we'd heard that the Russians had already advanced to the Elbe 
and we didn't know whether they would get to Hamburg first. We pray that it wouldn't be the Russians because their troops had a frightening reputation for looting and raping. However, one night we heard that the British were on their way and we were all very relieved. Before that, we'd been given orders to hold out and even attack. But as the British army drew near, our Mayor Kaufman said over the radio that we shouldn't do anything but just wait and see. And then next day we saw a single first tank arrive. It stopped on the corner of our street. For us, the war was over. In the first days of May, the entry into Hamburg finally took place, peacefully, to the relief of the troops and the people of the city. Thank goodness the city wasn't defended. The British came in and just took over peacefully. Every half hour we listened to news bulletins and we were told what we could and couldn't do. There was a nightly curfew from 10 o'clock and we weren't allowed out on the streets after then, though we younger ones often went out anyway. We were very relieved to see that the city was to be occupied by English troops. They marched down our street, the Hallestrasse, and we put out white flags and waved them. At first, the people weren't allowed out freely on the streets. The English troops were cautious in case anyone would still shoot at them. Though none of the troops were shot during the occupation, to my knowledge. The situation faced by the British occupying power and the people of Hamburg was truly formidable. Over 50% of the homes and a tenth of the entire built-up area was in ruins. The port itself was littered with the wreckage of warehouses and ships, along with its neighboring area. The whole communication system of the city was devastated. Road and rail bridges, viaducts, trains, goods yards, stations. Not only within the city, but in its links with the outside world. But restoration of communications was urgent. This was needed as much by the occupation forces as by the city itself, especially in the port area. The Blomenvoss submarine yards and the entire factory area bordering the harbour were devastated. Across the Elbe, the Harburg industrial area was equally damaged. The port was littered with the wreckage of cranes and bridges and some 3,000 ships and clearance seemed an all but impossible task. Yet by the end of May, Allied Supreme Headquarters announced that the port was cleared enough to be open to Allied shipping within days. There were enormous human problems for the people too. Thousands of them simply sat around in a daze. Others searched for food, shelter, missing friends and relatives. Street notice boards were covered with inquiries about separated husbands, wives, children. Ich suche Frieda Windler, geborene Jonoscheid, Königsberg. Ich suche meine Frau, Elfriede Schulz und Tochter Christa. Achtung, Stalingrad-Kämpfer. Wer kennt den Sanitätsunteroffizier Heinz Kuhlmann? Though many were stunned for days by what had hit them, life in the city soon began to stir again, in the efforts of people to cater for their ordinary everyday needs of food and shelter and looking after children. <laughs> 
From a state of shocked immobility, everyone was soon on the move again. The streets of Hamburg seemed to be filled with countless people, walking, cycling, in carts, everywhere. One of the very first priorities was to organize the resuming of essential services again, as quickly as possible. Services that needed the involvement of the citizens themselves, through carefully selected responsible representatives, as well as the military authority. The clearance of rubble, the restoring of power lines and public utilities, And then there was the enormous problem of housing. 40 million cubic meters of gutted houses and rubble. According to some authorities, the highest in European history. Housing had been given lesser priority status behind the port, industry and public buildings. Now the problem had become pressingly urgent. Thousands of people were trying to make a home within the rubble. Some living in cellars. Or upstairs in top story rooms without walls. Some were supplied with ex-army Nissen-type huts, those whose needs were greatest. Many living without light, fuel, soap. Living alongside open drains. The neighborhood pumps, their only source of clean water. Another top priority for the occupying power was to organize the output and distribution of coal. One of the nearest major coal fields was the Ruhr region. They set up Operation Coal Scuttle, taking no less than 30,000 ex-miners from the former German armed forces. But the biggest problem was to move the coal from the pithead to the power plants, due to scarce transport facilities. For the people themselves, there is no coal to spare. They can go into the woods to cut trees and brushwood. Meanwhile, the railways are organized to carry the loads where needed. And what can't go by rail goes by autobahn. As the months go by, People scan the newspaper ads daily for any news of missing relatives. In Hamburg, there's a British-run postal search service indexing inquiries, coming in at the rate of 50,000 per day. Anyone contacting relatives and wanting to travel by train must get a permit. Others traveling to outside the city by cycle horse-drawn truck or on foot, must wait in queues to cross the guarded bridges out of town, behind the military traffic which has priority. The occupation rail office personnel vet all non-military journeys by rail, since space on the train is absolutely at a premium. <laughs> 
It seems that the world and his wife were having to make some train journey or other during the first months after the war. Part of the reason for overcrowded trains was the desperate shortage of other public transport between the city and its neighboring towns and villages, as well as within the city itself. Hamburg's main station at this time was one of the constantly busiest places in town. There was also the fact that Hamburg had become packed with refugees, fleeing from the advance of the Russian army, and who now wanted to return to those hometowns in the east, which fell within the borders of the British occupation zone. Transportmöglichkeiten in Hamburg waren äh, absolut zusammengebrochen. Transport in the city had come to a complete halt. There were hardly any cars. And anyway, there wasn't any petrol if you had one. There were only a few bikes left at first, and no public transport. Everyone had to walk. My father was in hospital at the time, in Blankenese suburb, about nine miles away from our house. Each time we visited him, it took us half a day to get there, and the same to get home. We didn't get back till nightfall, and we saw my father for only half an hour. Meanwhile, the nightly curfew brought problems for the homeless. The former air raid shelters officially became their home each night after 10 p.m. The siren, which used to warn them of impending air raids, now signaled it was time to get off the streets. At least this time, not to escape from bombs. No matter was too small for the attention of the occupying power. There was, for instance, the subject of renaming some city streets. Such former names as Adolf Hitlerplatz, Horst Wessel Allee, were now clearly out of the question. It was time, too, to start handing back some matters of law and order to the people, with non-military public courts. And a new German police force, whose powers were regulated according to common law, respecting the rights of every citizen, and understanding that they were the protectors of the public, not their master. Then there was the matter of public health. The people were getting 1,000 to 1,200 calories a day, according to the type of work, about half of normal rations. But there was a survey team in the field, staffed by the Red Cross, checking the effects of those rations on the population. The tests were performed regularly, and reports sent to the Control Commission for them to judge whether the food was sufficient to allow the people to keep at work. For a long time, there was a real shortage of food. Even bread was scarce, in the towns anyway. There was a basic ration, but it wasn't enough. And a black market soon started up. Anything people still had left, personal possessions, they sold them on the black market to get food, cigarettes. Getting food was all we ever seemed to think about. And of course, there were the children. A large proportion of the citizens of Hamburg were children of school age. For the younger ones who came through unscarred, the ruins in this city were a giant adventure playground. But for the city administrators and the parents, education was the main problem. There was a severe shortage of teachers and classrooms. In midsummer of 1945, all schools were temporarily closed by order so that a proper program of education could be set up. As well as the reconstruction and provision of adequate new classrooms. Finally, on a welcome day in early August, the schools of Hamburg were reopened. At a time of year when most children elsewhere in the world were breaking up for the summer holidays. But that didn't bother the children or parents. For since the end of the war, life had been one long holiday from the classroom. But perhaps the biggest problem for Hamburg and other German cities was the destruction of their industrial capacity. Their factories had been left mostly a mass of twisted metal. <laughs> 
How then to restore them to the needs of peacetime and to those who are to work in them? Well, one thing there wasn't a shortage of was labor. The end of the war in Europe brought with it a great mass of able-bodied men with nothing to do, ex-members of the German armed forces. But they couldn't all be demobilized at once and constitute a new army, an army of the unemployed. Even though a vast amount of reconstruction would eventually have to be done, Examined first by a skilled, selected German interrogator, the longest serving men first were put through a screening process, filling in their demobilization papers. Then past history and character were checked by German-speaking British intelligence officers. The majority of men got through this process and were demobbed. Finally, there were German judges to be sworn in. Now, gentlemen, you'll raise your right hands and take the oath with me. I swear by Almighty God, I swear by God, God in my Mexican, that I will at all times, Clearing the rubble away was one of the most remarkable things. Everyone really set to it with a will. The main streets were very quickly cleared, and any undamaged material, any bricks and building stone, were salvaged and cleaned up to be used again. The less damaged sites were soon cleared and buildings started going up again. Shops and houses. The harbor was one of the priorities for reconstruction. All the damaged ships were very soon removed and the waterways opened up again. The River Elbe was quickly cleared of wreckage and the Aster Lakes were soon clean once more. One could enjoy going for a walk again in the parks, ice skating out of doors in winter. It was a new world out there. The road to recovery was long and hard, but the Alster lies at the heart of a vastly recovered home of almost two million people. Its symbols were fortunately mostly spared. Hamburg City Hall. St. Michael's now visible within a new frame of the 20th century. But St. Nicholas, in contrast, severely damaged and still unrepaired, once one of Germany's finest neo-Gothic churches and in fact, designed by a British architect, Sir George Gilbert Scott, 100 years ago, and now a war memorial. And there are the bright newcomers to the scene, such as the over 800 foot high television tower, probably a new symbol to be for the Hamburg of the future. And of course, the port, at the foot of Hamburg's hill above the Elbe. In spite of its total wartime destruction, the port today is still one of continental Europe's busiest. Some 15,000 ships each year carrying over 50 million tons of cargo of all kinds from over 100 countries across the world, sailing in to unload at one of its 40 miles of keys. The port which helped above all else to make the free and Hanseatic city-state of Hamburg. <laughs> 